It's quite odd for me to be uh, convening this meeting in Brussels. I spent a large part of the pandemic years, um, 2020, 2021, thinking a lot about the city because something very strange happened in the summer of 2020, where the EU, right at the beginning of the pandemic, was actually one of the first organizations to say, we're going to uh, make vaccines, COVID vaccines, a global public good. And then something strange happened. Fast forward three months and they do a quick U-turn. At the beginning, as far back as you know, May 2020, the EU was very clear on what it wanted to do. It said an agreement with the European Commission and put it in writing, in fact, and I remember those words because we spent a lot of time pouring through the minutes of those meetings to say we wanted to target global shortages and we wanted to make sure that these vaccines got to low-income and middle-income countries at very, very low prices. And then suddenly, come September, it's opposed to a waiver on all intellectual property at the World Trade Organization. It's opposed to the approach of vaccines as a global public good. And it's completely happy to have vaccines be considered private monopolies. For quite some time, this uh, U-turn on the European Parliament's behalf, the European Union's behalf, was, was quite puzzling until we found out why that happened. If you, th if you look at the months from the time they made the announcement to the next three months, the European commissioners took something like 170 meetings. 40 of them with big pharma executives, 117 of them with pharma lobbyists, and another 40 of them with Gates Foundation and their you know, allied networks in the complex that the Gates Foundation has. Not a single meeting with an NGO like Doctors Without Borders, not a single meeting with progressive political leaders from around the world. So, and we know what happened afterwards, with holding and profiteering, the complete abandonment of the people in the Global South. You know, David began this dialogue um, by pointing to the farce that the current political fora have become with empty words and promises. But it's not just that Brussels or Geneva or New York or DC have become a facade. It's also that the real machinations always occur somewhere else, in secret boardrooms, in international arbitration deals, it, or sometimes actually in complete transparency, in bailouts and unilateral um, coercive sanctions. So just looking back at the last three weeks, lies in Paris, saying that the 100 billion SDR special drawing rights target has been met, when we know that's blatantly untrue, that the US Congress has not approved another $20 billion. Um, you know, the EU's Maastricht Treaty sets a debt to GDP ratio limit of 60%. We know that every single country in Europe right now is somewhere around the 80s or the 90%, complete violation of their own rules. And the rules-based order that supposedly dictates that bondholders must be paid no matter what, must be paid no matter what, forcing the African continent to spend more on debt servicing for the two years of the pandemic than it spent, the entire continent spent, on its health expenditure. But at the same time, you look at Switzerland from a couple of months ago, and it's, it tells the bond, bondholders to wait, say we can't do anything, and risk legal action to bail out uh, Credit Suisse, as we've seen. And at this very moment, we know, and many of you in the room are coming from these problematic meetings, we know that the governments of the Global South are being chastised next door for not doing enough on uh, decarbonization, for not doing enough on climate change, when huge polluters like militaries of Europe, like the US military, which constitutes more than 5% of carbon emissions, is, continues to be exempt from all emission targets. You know, back in the days, um, the Tanzanian leader, Julius Nayeri, when he was working with the South Commission report, used to say we're being forced to sit through conferences and chant, theft is holy, theft is holy, theft is holy. I think in these days where we do have a facade of real supposed cooperation, hypocrisy is holy seems to be the chant that we're all supposed to sing and has in fact become, lies and hypocrisy have in fact become the sanctioned speech of the halls of power. And that's precisely why we've convened this dialogue. I think David and I can often be too optimistic about the cracks we see in the system and the openings that they pose for real transformation. But I think the real reading of this moment is not about optimism or pessimism, but the fact that the stakes are surviving. And we're meeting in the days following the hottest week uh, on record. Of course, not as hot given I'm coming from uh, Delhi in India. But the only real solutions, even in apocalyptic days, come to us from the South. Whether you look at human suffering, in the public health model from Cuba, or to climate catastrophe in the financing proposals that we've just heard from Gustavo Petro from Colombia, or to the emphasis on peace from countries uh, like Brazil, China, and South Africa. And so dialogue across the South-North divide is not only necessary to redress inequalities, but really about um, our very survival and is indispensable for human survival. 
I have no delusions here because I realize I'm acutely aware that the leader of the country that wields this narrative, perhaps most effectively, uh, is the Prime Minister of my own, Modi, who in no uncertain terms is very much on the wrong side of history. But I think that's why it's even more urgent that we reclaim that narrative, that we reclaim that space and have these dialogue from the progressive movement and continue to keep convening the South North dialogue. So thank you for giving us your time and for bringing us your ideas. Let's have a good discussion.